flipping an underground house in Grand Junction, Colorado. That's the topic of today's show. Let's dive in. Back, 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 back to those days. I was running, 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 running in one place. Set a, set a, set a, set a, set a, set a, set a pace. Feel like I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been running in one place. Yeah, I've been feeling pretty good. I've been feeling great. I've been feeling how I should, how I really should. Hey, real estate investors, welcome to another episode of the House Flipping Show here on Holton Wise TV. I am your host, James Wise, and that man right there is Tommy, capturing everything for your viewing pleasure. Uh, today's show, very unique, uh, very unique show, right? I spoke with an investor and an agent. She's an investor agent out there in Grand Junction, Colorado. Her name is Terry Styers, and she owns a company called Rejuvenation Homes, Inc., and uh this particular project, she didn't do very well on this flip, financially speaking. This is a woman who uh, flips homes regularly and regularly makes money flipping these homes. Uh, but this particular home, she did not do very well, but it happened to be her favorite flip project that she's done in her entire career, despite the fact that it didn't pan out well as a financial investment. And she loved this home so much because it was just such a unique project. And uh, it really was. I mean, the home itself was literally built underground. Let's take a look at the footage now. All right, Terry. So... I understand that you're a full-time flipper out there in Grand Junction, Colorado. You got a, a company called Rejuvenation Homes. Do you want to walk me and the audience through exactly uh, what it is you do at Rejuvenation Homes and what exactly Rejuvenation Homes does? Okay. Well, I am um, I'm a real estate broker. So Rejuvenation, a component of Rejuvenation Homes is my, my brokerage, and I work a lot with investors, and then I have a whole other group of um, uh, buyers that are car guys because my husband's a professional drag racer. Okay. We have a lot large network of guys that love cars and I know a great garage when I see one. So, so those tend to be my clientele, although I will work with anybody, obviously. Now, are you the broker owner of uh, Rejuvenation Homes? I am. Okay. I'm the president, broker owner. Yes. yes. Now, with okay. Rejuvenation Homes, do you... Uh, is this like a shop where it's just you and you just like to flip homes and work with clients that you meet through that? Or are you hiring realtors full time? I'm actually um, uh, what's called an employee broker. I have not brought in any employees as yet, but I am looking to do that okay. um, in the near future. Um, uh, just has to be the right person, right fit for my company. So right now I am the only the only broker. I do have a virtual assistant and, and other people on my team that work more on the flip side. But um, Okay. Yeah. But primarily, you're the only one selling. That's just interesting because, you know, as a broker owner myself, at one point, Holton Wise, we were doing the investment stuff. We were also doing like regular residential stuff. And we had like, I don't know, 50, 60 realtors. But uh, I just couldn't fall in love with that business. So we got rid of them all. And uh, we're back to our core, which is just uh, our, you know, multiple businesses that are catered around investing. So I was just interested in that. Yeah, okay, yeah. So. It's a good fit for me. I don't know that I would work well in, you know, one of the big brokerage houses or something. I, sure. I, I, I can't say I can find it constricting because I've never really even considered it. So I don't know the, the, the positives versus the negatives. I just know that it's probably not for me. So. Okay. Yeah. And like you enjoy flipping houses, right? You enjoy running the projects and <laughs> A big thing for like investors, you know, it's, it's guys like, I think a lot of people, Terry, I think they think that if they want to get their real estate license, they have to work at Century 21 or they have to work at Keller Williams and they have to drive buyers and stuff around. And uh, that's horrible. Like I wouldn't want to do that. I've never done that in my career. Um, but like, what's cool is a, a lot of investors, uh, like what you could do, you could do what you did, right? You got your license, you're a broker owner, but you don't hire uh, traditional folks. And I imagine this really helps your flipping business, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. I feel like it does um, uh, help my flipping business, but I think my flipping business is more helpful to my investor buyers because every time I do a project, I learn something. Generally, I learn 10 things and it just helps me have a better eye when I'm walking through properties with my investors, uh, because the market here, turnkey is not um, not a terribly profitable way. You know, investors have a little higher 
higher goal, I think, than what you can get with a turnkey property. So a lot of what I'm pushing, um, uh, I don't want to say pushing, um, what I'm broadcasting to my investors, I have an email um, uh, that I send out, uh, just kind of a group email, I'll say, yeah. hey, I saw this property and this is what I think about it, this lot could be split or that could have an addition or you know, whatever, and then I just throw it out there to all of them at once and generally I got two or three people will say, hey, that's kind of what I'm looking for, let's, let's go see this. Um, and so when we walk through, I can, I can look and say, oh, well, that's an FPE, you know, electrical service box. That's two grand right there. <laughs> you know, you, and I can show them thing and I can say, okay, this is a big deal. This isn't such a big deal, even though it's really ugly, it's real easy to fix and, you know, that sort of thing. So I think the fact that I've flipped helps me be uh, a better realtor for my type of clientele. You get to, you, you walk the walk, you talk the talk, right? I mean, that's what you do. That's great. As much as I can, yeah, yeah. yeah. I still, I mean, I still have experts that look at and uh, uh, things, and and you know, sometimes I'll just flat tell people, you know what, that's something that we would need to address in due diligence, and we would want to bring in, you know, an inspector or an electrician or you know, whatever. Yeah, sure. No, of course, that I makes sense. Have a general idea for sure. Yeah, absolutely. You kind of like set the tone, give them a ballpark thing. That's really yeah. good. So. Not only does your investing, like your investing business is essentially growing uh, your agent business, which is just additional income, right? Yeah. On top of that, uh, your, your agent business is also helping you squeeze out additional profits uh, in flips. So like the house that you want, you're coming on the show that we really wanted to have you on the house flipping show uh, was, it was just a really cool project that you did. Uh, we've nicknamed this one the Underground House Flip in Grand Junction, Colorado. And uh, we'll flash the numbers of your flip on the screen there, and we'll go through all those. But the first thing I want to highlight to all you guys is if you look, Terry, um, you know, incredible amount of money and effort went into this project. I mean, she, she took a house that was completely underground, and she, like, built it up, and she'll get into all that. But what I want to show you guys is if you look down there, guys, that profit – 1,964, and Terry's a pro. She knows that she didn't do hot on this one. That's obviously not the goal, but she'll tell us a lot about the story and how that happened. But what I want you guys to focus on is the fact that she is an agent, she is licensed. That's what actually kept her in the black on this deal. If she had to hire realtors and had to pay 7% on that 250,000 price point, uh, you would have been in the, in the red uh, close to 20 k so being an agent, it's just something that uh, investors out there, people who are trying to grow their flipping business, it's something you guys really need to think about. You don't have to be a traditional agent working for a big firm. You could be someone like myself. You could be someone like Terry uh, who is only flipping and also working with other people with similar interests. When you're a realtor, guys, you could work with whoever you want. If you really wanted to, you could just flip houses to keep yourself in the black like she did, and you don't have to deal with clients. I mean, that's your call. Um, so might, Terry, oh, I, go ahead. I might point out too on the front end when I'm making offers on properties, a lot of times I'll use my realtor status to get a commission to not get a commission, but use okay. it as a playing card. I'll put it, I'll put in the contract that, you know, I'm going to waive the first 5,000 or I'm going to waive all of it or whatever so that I can maybe lowball them a little or just simply be more competitive. Sure. Um, it, it, it's a, it's six to one, half dozen and another. You're basically using that commission, like for this property, right? Like uh, if everybody else is offering 58,000 and a 3,000 commission is going to their realtor, you could either buy it at 58 and get a $3,000 check, or you can just buy it at 55. So you're able to, on the front end, you know, take that 3% or 4% or 2%, whatever it is, you're able to make that a net discount on your front end as well as make the savings on the back end. Great point. Right, right. Yeah. And that's what you did here? Um, yeah, yeah, a little, a little bit, yeah. I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, unfortunately, it, was <laughs> it wasn't meant to be a long time ago, but it was a long time ago when I bought that. <laughs> well, let's get into it, man. T tell me the story about this house. I'll shut up so you can uh, lay us out. I mean, this is a cool project. I've never seen, you sent me the picture and I was like, Terry, I don't understand what I'm looking at. What the hell is this? Because there wasn't a house. <laughs> so yeah. tell us the story. What happened with this flip? Walk me through it. Well, first of all, I do want to say that I've done dozens of flips before. And so, you know, this one, 
This one is probably my most favorite product and okay. my most favorite outcome, even though the dollars weren't there. Um, I, I still just really loved it. But yeah, I saw it. I'm a realtor. I'm on the computer every single day and it popped up in the MLS, but it popped up on a Sunday. And, you know, of course, the Sunday paper, here they still advertise in newspapers because we're a smaller market and stuff. You know, it, nobody was seeing it yet because it was too, you know, it just hit on a Sunday. And I grabbed my husband and I said, let's go look at this property and um, went out right away and saw it. Did, and you guys take, did you guys take one of the drag racing cars to get there before any other buyer? Yeah, no, I don't think we took. It was, uh, it was probably, we don't have, I guess we do now have, um, what we call ice, an ice cream car or two, but yeah, I don't think we had one then. All so. right, so the only advantage, the speed advantage, you just utilize your status as an agent to get on the MLS quicker. We went, we drove the speed limit to the house, though. Drove the speed limit to the house, yeah, and got out, and it's funny because it's on a fairly main thoroughfare, um, which in hindsight turned out to be a detriment that I did not give enough um, uh, thought to. Because um, that was one of the arguments when I went to sell it was that people didn't necessarily want to live on this slightly busier road. But anyway, it was on a major thoroughfare that we have been by a million times. I've lived in this town 35 years. My husband's lived here since junior high. Neither of us had ever, ever noticed this house because it, you know, it had some trees and shrubs and things and it's an underground house. So it was short. And, you know, it was like, I know it's got to be here somewhere and danged if it wasn't. So we turned in and, and saw this ugly, squatty little concrete thing with a, uh, you know, it had a little like um, hut on the end, which was actually the way you got into the underground house. You went in this little hut and then there was a staircase down into the underground house and, and stuff. And we, I mean, we looked at it and um, there was, there was a little cottage on the property that we since came to think was the, maybe the original house from the thirties. Um, it didn't have any, any water or sewer or anything like that. The underground house was constructed in the 50s. There was a single car garage um, that was, I don't know, probably from the 1960s or something. And there was a really big, fairly new shed. And uh, it was, I think about, it was either 16 or 20 feet long and um, eight feet wide, like, it was a big, nice shed. And my husband immediately went to it and was like, ooh, this could be moved to our place. And I said, no, this cannot be moved because it is the nicest thing on this whole property right now. <laughs> and, and it needs to stay. And we did utilize it a lot for, you know, deliveries of appliances and cabinets and, and things like that. So, so it was just this ugly little squatty house. It smelled bad. The, the lady that owned it had lived in it for 20 years. Um, and she had um, a situation come up where she needed to become the caretaker for a grandchild, and it was just too small. And so she had moved out and rented it to a gal with four pit bulls. And so this gal and these four pit bulls were living down in this little underground house, and it didn't smell good, and it didn't look good. And, you know, they weren't asking a whole lot of money for it. And I said to my husband, I was like, what do you think? And he's like, he said, I think the, the lot with the utilities is probably worth that. And of course, he in the back of his head, he was still thinking, and that $15,000 shed is a nice, <laughs> nice <laughs> bird. <laughs> but he did not win on that one <laughs> and stuff. So anyway, yeah, we wrote essentially a full price offer um, on it. I did. And um, um, I'm trying to remember, I think I did waive my commission, run, run in a little bit less and waive my commission and, and told him that we would close when the tenant was gone, that we were not going to take position possession as long as there was a tenant and four pit bulls in place on the property. Um, tenants are, uh, <clears throat> tenants are tough. Uh, I try not to buy people. I, I'm yeah. a flipper. I'm not a landlady. I'm a flipper. So I don't want to buy people. I just want to buy property. Understood. <laughs> For anybody else uh, who's watching this show right now, um, if you are interested in knowing why people like Terry are going to be interested in uh, being a flipper and are totally avoiding tenants, uh, you're going to want to check out another show we have here on Holton Wise TV. That's the Tenants from Hell show. Uh, there's just some wild content on there. So uh, we'll get back to Terry's story right now uh, after we go to a quick word from the sponsor of today's show. Based in Indianapolis, Indiana, 
FS Houses is the premier investment property brokerage with an in-house property management department that can take care of all those unwanted landlord headaches. FS Houses can offer you the complete turnkey solution as well as wholesale properties offered to you at a discounted rate. With a network of thousands of active investors, wholesalers, and brokers, FS Houses can help you sell your property for top dollar on the open market or in a hurry to motivated investors seeking distressed real estate. Visit fshouses.com or call 317-492-9025 for more information on the Indianapolis, Indiana real estate. Holton Wise has a worldwide audience of real estate investors. If you are a lender, home inspector, or anyone else with a real estate related business who would like to increase your sales and exposure with an ad in one of our videos, go to holtonwise.com today. All right, guys, welcome back. We're talking with Terry from Grand Junction, Colorado, about her underground house flip. Uh, thank you guys uh, for watching that commercial break. We got to keep the lights on here. And Tara, you were saying that uh, you do not want to be involved in the landlording business. So you wanted that tenant to move out of that property. So let's pick it up there. The tenant is now gone and you close on the house. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the tenant had a lease through the end of December and this was um, probably October when I wrote the, um, wrote the offer. And so we thought we had a while and I had a couple other projects that were wrapping up. Um, uh, however, they called me and they said the tenant is out and we're ready to close. And so I ended up buying it on November 15th of 2017 when I didn't really think I was going to own it till about January. So it sat for like six weeks with absolutely nothing going on because I had other projects in the works. And then of course you have the holidays and, and all of that. And so come January, the, we finally got over there and started really assessing what we had. And I, I have and, a question, Terry. I'm so, sorry to cut you off, but now you closed, you said November 15th, 2017. Uh -huh. Did you pay cash or did you use a bank loan, a private loan? I, I use um, a HELOC for the okay. majority of my, so, so it was to them, it, it was cash, but I just use a HELOC. Um, okay. For everyone that's watching, if you guys are not familiar with that term, HELOC, H-E-L-O-C, that stands for Home Equity Line of Credit. So what that means is uh, Terry and her husband in the home that they personally live in, they had some equity. So Terry tapped into that equity, was given a loan, essentially a lump sum of cash. So she now has cash and she's able to then make uh, as is cash offer to this uh, seller. So to that seller, it's completely cash. But Terry essentially did this deal uh, more or less no money down because she didn't have to pull that money out of her pocket, guys. She was able to leverage other real estate that she owned. Great move out of you, Terry. Let's uh, let's pick it up from there. Okay, okay. So then we, we start assessing the property. And one of the things, I, I immediately, you know, the very first time I saw it, knew that I wanted to build a duplex, that I wanted to keep that lower unit and rehab it but put another house on top because the property okay. was zoned correctly for that. And so that was always my intention. Um, so we did things like, you know, I had an engineer come and do an assessment on the, what was there, the part of the house that was sticking up. Is this sturdy enough, thick enough, et cetera, to be built on? And he wrote me a letter, you know, that was stamped with his, his seal that said, yes, it was. And I, I, um, uh, you know, started having plans drawn up. And to be honest, I, other than we had a home built in 2016, I've never really done totally new construction. And essentially that's what I was doing on this upper unit. And so I, I made some mistakes um, uh, in that. One of them was the, uh, the guy that did my drawings um, had this real cute, you know, gable roof on the property, which I wanted. I felt like the gable end roof was a good fit for the neighborhood because it's a neighborhood full of homes from like the 40s through the 60s and things. And I wanted it to, to you know, I didn't want to do something like super modern or angular or anything because it just wasn't going to be a good fit. Uh, but it was like a really steep roof pitch. And so there's a lot more wood involved. And then they charge you more for roofing. And so so that was a mistake that, that I made as a kind of a newbie as far as new construction. I could have had I gotten a general 
contractor involved sooner, done a better job of um, designing so that it was a more cost-effective build. If you so that, uh, that was a mistake on my part. If you had to do it over again, what type of roof would you have uh, put on there? I would still I would still do a gable, but this was like a six twelve pitch, and I would drop probably to maybe a four twelve. Okay. Uh, not quite so steep and high. Um, by the time this property was set upon, you know, one on the other, it ended up being really, really tall. Um, and so I had to address some of that visual, you know, down the road, which um, I can tell you about now if you want. Or you yeah, know, sure, you know. sure. What 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 happened? So what happened was, um, first of all, we we tore the roof off. They, they convinced me that instead of doing a pony wall, um, they being the, the general contractor and some others, um, that we needed to just tear the roof off of the existing underground house and build directly on it. Um, but when we tore the roof off the existing underground house and the framer showed up and started shooting it, we realized that it was not level on all four sides it was and it wasn't the kind of like thing you can just wedge a little bit here and there we needed to pour up to about 11 inches of new concrete on top of the old concrete to bring everything to a, a nice height um, and nice and level to build on so now we've got the height of the underground house plus another 12 inches and then we're building a whole new house with the general contractor said you know what 10 foot walls don't cost you much more than you know, then eight foot walls, and this is a small, uh, by the way, this is a small piece, it's 24 by 24 each unit, so the size of a double okay. garage, you know, so okay. 10, 10 foot ceilings, we're, we're going to make it feel more spacious, he was correct, uh, as far as the upper unit, so now we've got these 10 foot walls on there, and then we've got the steep roof that I okayed with the drawings, and now I've got this towering cube that when you walk up to it, you know, it's really tall. And the side that you, where you enter from the driveway um, uh, looked like a drive-in movie screen. It was just this <laughs> giant, tall stucco because you couldn't put really windows on that side because of how the, um, uh, the, in, the floor plan inside, you know, windows needed to be placed strategically or you would lose furniture placement, closets, that sort of thing. So I had this giant wall and I cured that down the road when the stucco people came. I had them, you know what pop-outs are around window frames on stucco. You know, it's like a, a framing. I had them put three fake windows, essentially. They put the pop-outs there. And then I bought hand-painted Mexican tile and had it inserted in those windows for a decorative look. But it also broke the space up really nicely and people really liked it. Um, and you still, on the inside, didn't have windows where windows didn't didn't belong so so you know the the contractor is like well you know 10 foot walls it's not that much more lumber you know uh, but you've also got that much more stucco and that much more sheetrock and that much more <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, well he kind of had a point I didn't I didn't think it through as the, as well as I should have I was just excited about what it was gonna gonna look like and and you know went along with it so now we've got this really tall thing the other thing is Originally, I mean, this was a, a house that had been lived in consistently since the 1950s. It was a livable space. It was just ugly and didn't smell good, and I was just going to update it. Well, once we peeled the roof off and kind of got a look at the inner workings, if you can imagine having a bird's eye view then of a house, we started realizing that it was really pretty crummy stuff. It wasn't straight. You know, the guys were going to have to do a lot of fudging to, to make walls and, and doorways look right again and, and things. And um, so the experts convinced me that the very best thing to do was just to gut that lower unit, just clear it out. And also, essentially, I started with a concrete foundation and, and built from there. So that was another, you know, pretty pricey thing to do. I did leave, you know, I'd already had the drawings done, so I did leave the footprint in the lower unit the same. So it, it stayed as a one bedroom. The bathroom was where the bathroom was. The kitchen was where the kitchen was. Um, and so we worked the plumbing and stuff that way. But essentially, I, I started from scratch other than a foundation. Um, 
that I had to add to and, and spend money on as well. So, so, so when you so uh, that was like from the start, but things okay. went wrong. <laughs> so when you originally bought the home, um, I I presume right, you know, you're an agent. You have you've been doing this a while. So like you probably when you originally brought the bought the home, did you project out that you would be planning on selling it at two fifty? Um, actually, no. Um, and okay. it, I projected that it would that it, my cost and the end price, um, the end price would be about 200. Okay. Um, however, we had um, a fairly significant market uptick all the time that I was working on it. So every time I spent a few thousand more, the market also upticked enough um, that I was keeping pace. Um, to a certain extent. I mean, eventually you will run out of, I mean, something's only worth what something's worth and it doesn't matter if you spend 20 grand more on it, it's still only worth, you know, what it's worth. Um, Absolutely. But, but I was able to make up uh, a lot of that um, in there. And something I didn't talk about yet when during the um, initial phase, once I had my engineer letter and we figured out about the concrete, I had to submit all those drawings to the building department. And apparently nobody had done a duplex in a million years that was over, over, under. People build them side to side. And you have it when you're doing a true legal duplex or any sort of multifamily, you have what's called fire separation. You have to make sure that one unit can't burn another unit down quickly. Um, they want a one hour, you know, they use the international residential codes um, to build by and they want at least a one hour fire separation um, between units. And the building department was just kind of having a fit. Normally what you do is you take products like, you know, your, your um, uh, sheetrock, you know, 5 sheet sheetrock and stuff and you add up, you know, this takes 20 minutes to burn through. That takes half an hour to burn through. And you, you just kind of do a math thing and, and build uh, based on that. They weren't letting me do that. They kept kicking it back saying, no, you know, we don't, you know, we don't like this. And what they made me do was find what's called a UL approved. So everybody's familiar with, you know, um, United Labs, UL approved um, floor assembly, which was, I had to use, um, I Joyce, which I was going to use anyway, but I had to ended up buying a like a gypcrete product, which is essentially a concrete product that came in four by eight sheets. They weighed 180 pounds each and cost $200 each. And I had to lay that in the upper unit to create the fire separation that they were wanting. They wanted something that had already been true, tried and tested and UL approved as opposed to just the normal mathematical thing. And, and, you know, I probably could have battled it more, but things just kept going back and forth and back and forth. And every time they required something, it cost me more for new drawings. And I find, so I finally, I caved and I bought that product, which was almost $5,000 and added about $7 a square foot to the cost of construction. So there's this new, new thing, but dang, it was fireproof. Um, so, <laughs> you know, and it was heavy. They had to crane that stuff in and they couldn't just set it. They had to like disperse it around because it couldn't all just be piled in one spot or else hey. it would have <laughs> and, it, and it ain't cheap to get a crane out to a job site, yeah. that's for sure. No, no. <laughs> so here's my, my cheap little, yeah, <laughs> down and dirty underground house is, you know, starting to, to add up. And then, you know, they go to do things. They go to dig um, to lay a, a foundation for that. Um, we had to add, uh, we took down the little shanty that they did have to access the lower unit and built something new and moved the door to where you had a straight shot down the stairs and could actually get a sofa down there and stuff. But we had to pour new, a new pad for that part as well. And they go to start to dig that out and dang if there wasn't a cistern from the 1950s or whatever, because that used to be a rural area and they didn't have city water. <laughs> and so now there's this giant tank that has to be dealt with and caved in and filled in and, and redone. And, you know, so that was another you know, one of those other things. And so, you know, it was those kinds of things that just um, added up. Gotcha after another, after another exactly. here. Exactly. You know, and the little cottage and garage that were detached, the little cottage was nice enough that it was worth finishing out. So we added, we added heat and insulation and, you know, a decent floor and walls and, and lighting and such um, because it was a decent little workspace and things. Um, 
and then the garage, but now you had to determine, well, whose space is that? And if I'm building a duplex, then, um, you know, we don't know who's going to be utilizing that. And this is Colorado. Heat's a big deal. You know, you pay, you pay money for that. And so I had a, um, a, a system of electricity put in that was for three units. So I paid extra for a third, uh, third billing, third meter um, setup so that now whoever uses that space um, can be assigned that bill. Uh, instead of it automatically going to the upper unit or automatically going to the lower unit, you know. So, sure. you know, those giant panels are not cheap. Um, you know, it's a special order and it's more more money. So that was another, you know, one of those other decisions that, that I made and I'm happy with and satisfied with. But, you know, uh, just kind of went into things a little blind. You know, I had my 20% um, contingency budget. And that was gone about the time the five thousand dollar floor went, <laughs> <laughs> and then everything else was over and above. That. So, with all of these gotchas that ended up happening, uh, your full total reno budget ended up being, you know, pretty high, uh, one hundred seventy thousand dollars, one hundred seventy ninety six. What was your? Um, original plan like did, did you have like a what was your original rough ballpark budget my rough ballpark budget was that i was going to be able to do it for about 125 dollars a square foot for the new construction part and i was going to spend about fifteen thousand on the lower unit part and so um it's been a long time now so that math is <laughs> Obviously, somewhat escaped me, but you know, I had planned if I sold it at two hundred thousand dollars, I was going to make maybe twenty thousand dollars or so. I don't, you know, okay. I'm not I'm not HGTV. We don't have the, those giant, you know, <laughs> giant paychecks and stuff. Around. But I was going to make I was going to make a decent decent profit. Well, so. I mean, hey, twenty thousand dollars. It's not a bad paycheck, and uh, you know, one thing. If anybody out there. Is talking to somebody who's flipped a ton of houses and they're telling you they've never lost money on a flip. They either haven't flipped enough houses or they're lying to you. I have been in the business 30 years and have never lost money on a flip. I, well, I, 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 I would say this kind of cost is a lot. I, I, I have only made $1,900. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we're still going to have to count this as a loss. Though. <laughs> yeah, it, was not, it was not at all what I intended. And yes, it took a year and a half out of my life and, and, or, or more. A little well, that's more. a good, yeah, so I wanted to ask you next. So, I mean, that's a huge, right? That's a gigantic project, $170,000. Um, mm -hmm. How long did it take for you to finish the project? Well, it took us from January when we truly, when I was truly starting, you know, I bought in November, really started working on things in January, did not receive my permit to begin until May. And I remember that we started, we ripped the roof off and stuff during June and kind of gotten and had to figure out the concrete issue and stuff. It was the week of 4th of July when we were laying the floor, the, the expensive floor, and so that we could really start framing and going going after it. So it was a good six months from the time I wanted to start until I was really, you know, seriously rolling along. And that's um, July 2018, right? Correct. Okay, correct. so just for everyone following around, we, we acquired the asset November 15th, 2017th. Mm -hmm. We're now at July 18th, or I'm sorry, July in. 2018 and she's cooking so when yeah. was the literally last day the day you put that for sale sign up in the yard it was late it was late january that we were getting our final um inspections and um got our co issued like the first week of february so it was about a it was about a six month process to get it the two units reconstructed okay. and built and stuff which isn't which isn't horrible we're we're in the same boat that everybody else is in the subs excuse me are busy and you know we would be rolling along and then we would have to wait you know nine days for the roofer you know and we'd be rolling along and then you'd have to wait for the you know because they're busy and and frankly this was a small project it's not a, a big fancy project and they you know would put other things in front of me i remember the flooring guy doing that to me a couple times in december and i ended up 
finally firing him and, and just getting somebody else to do it because, I mean, he just flat out said, oh, I got this other job. I'm going to go, you know, and it's like, well, you said you were going to do my job. You know, well, this is big. I can't turn it down. It's like, well, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I felt like I was being snubbed and I was. Um, would would you uh, say that uh, dealing with contractors and subs is one of the hardest things about flipping houses? Me dealing with them is not as hard as contractors and subs hate each other. And I find <laughs> the dang kindergarten teacher always trying to make people be nice. You know, like the you know, the plumber is pointing fingers at the electrician and the electrician doesn't like that somebody, you know, the sheetrock guy did this and you know, that kind of stuff. And I get it, you know, everybody would like to just work there all by themselves and you know they'll and I've had them walk away show up and say there's too many people here I'll come back another time and say no that's you know it's two hundred dollars a week for interest come back you know? <laughs> <laughs> but you know you, you, you they are subcontractors so your your choice is you put up with that or you find somebody else but it's not like being an employer you can't <laughs> yes yeah. You will stay and you will work these hours and, and stuff. Yeah, that said, I've worked showed up at places plenty of times on, you know, Thursday night or Sunday morning and found people working when I thought they wouldn't be. And and that's by choice on their part, you know, because they are subs. They can work, you know, do their hours and things. So a lot of them are very hardworking people. But yeah, it's it's annoying and, and yeah, it doesn't always proceed at a a nice rolling rate it can be start and stop and back up a couple steps and oh now we have to cancel this guy because we just found that and so now you know the electrician can't come because now we're you know <laughs> yeah that's uh that's something that i think a, a lot of uh a lot of new flippers out there that they get kind of taken by surprise uh in the contracting business um it's it's, it's almost like you take folks that are trying to invest in real estate for the first time and they think it's like, um, like, you know, when I want milk, I go to the store, I give the store my money and they give me milk. Uh, so I, I feel like a lot of uh, folks that, you know, they feel like a lot of things are that way. I want gas. I go to the gas station. They give me gas. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily work exactly like that in the contracting field. Like sometimes you could be standing out there like somebody take my money and exactly. do what you're going to tell me you're going to do. And it, it doesn't always work that way. And it's like a ton of bricks that uh, just hits investors in the face when they realize that uh, dealing with contractors is like totally different than anything anybody's ever. Uh, it's like a totally different ball game than hiring or, or conducting business with any other group that you've probably ever experienced. Right, right. No, I, I totally agree with that. And I do. I make jokes all the time about, I have a checkbook. <laughs> <laughs> so, so time, you know, 30 some years ago, my husband and I did a lot of this stuff ourselves and kind of self-taught and stuff. But, but we didn't do like a brand new duplex the way I just did. And we both, you know, he has his job and I have mine and, and stuff. And so now we do, we rely on other people to, um, to want an income <laughs> sure. and want sure. to take my money and, and want to do a good job because they know that I do, I'm going to do another one and another one. And, and stuff, so. Absolutely. So, all right. So we're about February, 2019 now, and you've got this thing, you listed it yourself because that's your job. You're a real estate agent as well, which is great for your bottom line here, which is technically keeping you in the black there. <laughs> yeah. um, so February, 2019, you list this on the MLS yourself, I presume. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Okay. I put it out there and I got lots of traffic and, you know, agents, we get the feedback reports and stuff. And throughout the, um, uh, the sales time, I have never seen the word cute used more times. <laughs> okay. People really liked it. It was really, it was cute. You know, I would get that back all the time. Cute, but maybe not big enough because the upper unit I designed as a two bedroom, which meant, you know, it was kind of tight spaces, but I, I thought they were well designed. You know, you could put a queen bed in the big bedroom and you could, you know, I did full size on kitchens and bathrooms and lots of storage and cut out storage above closets, you know, because 10 feet in the air, you know, you might as well have something um, up there and stuff. And, and I got, I did, I got really good feedback. I listed it at 259. Um, the majority of the feedback I got originally felt that that was a good, good price uh, on it. 
uh, and I got an offer almost right away for about two forty-five from a realtor. And of course, by then I knew my I knew my numbers. I knew okay. where I was, and and I also knew that two forty-five was probably not not a good number. Um, that I could do a little bit better than that. And by the time I paid him a commission, I would be upside down. You know, I mean, I knew I knew by December that I was running out of profit. Um, okay. But, you know, I mean, it, it, this wasn't news to me or anything, but sure. we did, so we did turn down the very first offer we got, and then we got another offer um, in uh, from a, a real estate agent and um, accepted it. You know, and it was at the by then I had lowered my price to the two forty nine because I was two forty nine nine because I was getting more feedback now that that maybe that was going to be the better the better price point and stuff. So I did I did do a price drop. And you get to a point in a project where you have to start focusing on return of capital as opposed to return on capital. Exactly, exactly. I needed my money back. I had other projects that I, I wanted to do. Um, I already, I, December 31st of 2018, so essentially about the time this project was wrapping up, I purchased a vacant lot. And I okay. had another project that I needed to get rolling, and my HELOC has a finite amount of money. And you know, by the time I purchased that and was finishing up this one, and so you know, I was starting to be a little cash poor too. Sure. Um, so and couldn't do much with that that new project till I got some money back on this one. So we got the first offer in, and we're rolling along on that on first contract. I mean, it was an offer that we accepted, and we're rolling along, and. Um, the uh, the buyer backed out, and um, you know their realtor wasn't able to convince. It was nothing to do with anything that I could do about it. Um, you know, this is somebody else's client. We have here in Grand Junction uh, what's called mill tailings. We were a uranium mining area back in the in the fifties, and the federal government when it was um, and forties. You know, when they were doing you know, bombs. <laughs> um, <laughs> They, they were very generous and they would do all this mining and they would just give away the dirt and people hauled the dirt to all over town and they used it in yards and they used it in basements and they used it. And then they figured out that everybody was glowing in the dark and it wasn't a good idea that all this mill tailings were on these properties. And so they did this big super fun cleanup thing back in the 90s and cleaned it all out again and hauled it <laughs> away. <laughs> And so now when you buy a property, you, you get what's called a mill tailings report. And this little gal that was buying my house had never heard of this. She was moving from another area, wasn't familiar with it. I provided the mill tailings report, which said that my property was clean, that there had never been any tailings in the buildings themselves, that there had been some out kind of on the front lawn that had been removed, and that, you know, the site was now clean. You know, it had the stamp of approval from the, from the U.S. government on it. Well, she just freaked out. Um, she didn't, she said, that's crazy, you know, renters are going to sue me, and I'll never be able to sell the property, and I don't want any property that has had mill tailings on it, and her realtors tried to tell her, you don't understand, you're not going to buy <laughs> within your budget much of anything in Grand Junction that didn't at one time have, have this, you know, if it's clean, it's clean, you know, um, sure. and, they, and they made me get a gamma ray survey, you know, when I uh, built, which is also for natural rate on it. To no feelings, I came up clean on that as well. But no, you couldn't convince her, and so she terminated. And so I was like, "Oh, great!" So you know, now it's been on the market and then off the market, and now it's back on the market, which is never great, you know, because sure. people immediately get suspicious. Well, what what happened? What's wrong with this? You know? So we put it back on the market, and another realtor brings me a buyer, and the buyer. Um, doesn't make it to the finish line. I get a termination notice because over a weekend, he went out and bought, financed a motorcycle because the weather was getting spring-like and he wanted a motorcycle and he financed one and now he no longer qualified for his loan. <laughs> and I just wanted to wring his neck, but of course this wasn't my client and he was, you know, another realtors and apparently they didn't do a good enough job of explaining that, you know, you can't, you can't change your financial circumstances right in the middle of a deal like that. It's, yep. it's not, <laughs> yep. at, We've at, all been there. <laughs> at minimum, you check with, you know, your, your lender and say, look, I kind of want to do this. Am I okay? Um, but no, he didn't. And so he wasn't going to get his loan. And so we terminated another time. Okay. And so now we've had it off the market for a while while it was under contract. And now it's back on the market again. 
And so then, you know, it's on the market and another realtor brings me a buyer. And this buyer, um, uh, to be honest, he had, I had already, I had a duplex for sale listed with, for a client and he had put an offer on it that was accepted and he had terminated on it. So I was already a little bit leery okay. of, because I, I had inside knowledge. But no, he liked mine better than that one. Mine was much newer. That one was an old property and stuff. So he put one on mine and, and we go through things and we do inspections and he tries to, you know, get me to do things. You know, some stuff was kind of ridiculous, but I, I agreed to it. But one of the things he wanted me to do was cut down a tree that was behind a fence um, at my back property line. And I said, you know, that's, that's not my tree. And that's not my property. And he said, well, it hangs over that garage over there. And I was like, and it's not my garage. And I'm not cutting that tree. You know, not my tree, not my land, not my garage. <laughs> the, tree, <laughs> the tree's going to stay. Well, he was okay with that. But then he got onto a kick about drainage. And because the house is here and the, the garage and stuff is there, there's this narrow driveway that goes between the two and of course you've got this big tall house with this big roof that's sending water you know and we had gutters and 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 downspouts and everything and so i understand drainage we have a high desert climate here and and soils can be expansive and stuff and so when we were doing our final grading i had the guys put what's called a v-pan which is you just dig down and create a, a pocket between buildings you know kind of a V shape. And so water slopes away from buildings on either side and goes into this V pan and then is, is taken away like down to the street um, and stuff. And, and this guy just was convinced that there was not proper drainage. And I was like, look, it's, you know, it's Colorado, but it's actually raining and it's raining quite a bit. We got a lot of rain in April. I said, Go to the property and look, there is not a puddle. D dig there's not you know <laughs> the water the v pan is working here's a copy of the receipt um you know he went out and he dug in some arbitrary spot and he said well the ground's wet and i'm like it's raining <laughs> <laughs> yes the ground is wet but the water isn't staying there's no standing water that's what you you worry about anyway he ended up terminating over that we just couldn't convince this him guy sounds not. like a nightmare i got a question yeah. for you because you sure. said he already backed out of another one. How yeah. many, as an agent, how many, uh, how many times do you let a buyer uh, back out of deals before you totally kick them to the well, curb? You know, that would be a question for the other agent, but I would be having a serious conversation because I told the other agent. The other agent wasn't very familiar with construction or remodeling. She's like, well, and, and that's what this guy said. This guy well, like as a seller though, right? Like if this, like now yeah. this guy, you, you've... You worked with him uh, once on one of your eight clients' deals. Now, this time, you were not representing him, obviously, but you were the seller. So that's two. So if you yourself are selling another one of your projects and he comes up to you and he puts in a bid, are you going to be like, no, I'm not taking your, your bid? Or would you give him a third shot? I don't, you know, I don't – boy, it would really depend on the property. I would be very, very leery of this person at, at this time. Yeah. And being that I'm not, I'm not his agent. I wasn't his agent on the first one. Okay. I was representing the seller. I was representing myself as the seller on this one. Since I'm not handholding and having these conversations with him to really understand, you know, things, it's all having to go through this other person, you know, being the other realtor. Yeah, I would be pretty leery, I would think. Yeah, I think uh, you back out of two deals, especially for some of the arbitrary reasons mentioned. Uh, yeah. I would, uh, I would, I would blacklist that guy. He wouldn't be buying any yeah, of my property. Yeah. So I, I think that the other agent is still working with him, and I, I wish him luck. But with his budget and his pickiness, well, he, then that was the thing. He kept saying, you know, well, I'm, I'm. I'm in the building industry. Well, he was, he was a house painter. He was a very young house painter, somewhere 25 years okay. old. Okay, sure. And I kept trying to say, you know what? I'm in the business too, and I, I do understand this. You know, it's like, oh, a lot of things could happen. Like, I understand <laughs> that. That's why, we, that's why this receipt says VPAN. That's why there's 12 inches of gravel in there. That's why, you know, <laughs> $1,200 on gutters and downspouts. I understand. Yeah. You <laughs> You can't just let water fall wherever it wants to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So after the third guy walks, uh, you finally get your actual buyer who ended up making it to the closing table. Yeah. And that was a different, um, kind of a different thing. This was a referral kind of, a, he was a friend of a friend and that person, the, the friend contacted me. So I know this guy and he needs to get rid of a fixer house and he, 
you know, um, uh, and he needs to buy someplace new. Is that, I thought about you. Is that something that, you know, you'd be interested in? And I said, well, sure, you know, have him, have him call me and I'll, I'll talk to him and stuff. And so the guy calls and, and it's actually a divorce situation and they're, they're in the family home and they need to get rid of the family home and they need to each have money to move on to another house and, and stuff. And, you know, would I come see it? And to be honest, it's not the kind of house that I really want to do anymore. I mean, I've done them, you know, but it's your typical suburban three bedroom, two bath house and, and things. And I go look at it and it's bad. It's not, it's all cosmetic, but it is so dirty and so worn out. And so, and it's in this really nice neighborhood and it's like, wow, you know, you people just gave up. Um, like, a lot, like he told me his sprinkler system had quit three years ago, so they just didn't water anymore. You know, well, this is called the high desert. You know, if you don't water, you don't have, you know, you don't have anything. Um, and so, yeah, I went and saw it, and, you know, he'd already had another realtor through who had given him a number, and that realtor had told him, 240,000 as is. And the neighborhood sells in the 275 to 295 range. Um, and, and the 240 was maybe a tad high, but not, not terribly off. But by the time they paid a realtor 6% and they had already refinanced it pretty recently, they weren't going to have much left. They weren't going to have what they needed to get into a new place or anything. And so, you know, I was just kind of toying with the idea, do I want to buy this place and, and try to make a few dollars at it? I wasn't looking at, and then just try to help this guy find something. I had actually considered my duplex. I never mentioned it to him because I thought that was way too self-serving. And I'm not, I'm not supposed to put my wants and needs ahead of a buyer's wants and needs. And what he was telling me verbally that he was looking for was essentially the same house he already had, but you know, somewhere else and, and affordable. Okay. And so I'm sitting at an open house and get a call from him. And he's apparently looked me up on my website and, and he's like, I am at your duplex on 29 road right now. Can you come show it to me? I really like this. And I said, well, you know, I'm doing an open house, but I can be ready in a couple hours and I will come show it to you. So I go and show it to him and he's like, oh my God, this is great. I love it. You know, this is wonderful. And oh, I can rent the bottom to somebody and help make my mortgage payment. And this is, this is, you know, this is wonderful. And I'm thinking, you know, this is kind of weird, but okay. And I'm still, I'm not you know, I was just so leery at that point of being stung by people that I really, I wasn't terribly nice to him about it. I said, okay, well, if you're serious about this, I want you to go to your lender and I want this, this, and this, and I want your soon-to-be ex-wife on board. And, you know, I was just kind of pretty strict. And man, this guy just started jumping through hoops and producing, you know, what I asked. And um, what ended up happening was I ended up accepting his house because I was using a HELOC. I technically had no financing involved, um, okay. but no lender to pay off. And so we went to the closing table and he, um, they gave me their house. She got a check for her portion of the equity. He used his portion of his equity as a down payment on my place. And um, I walked out with cash in my pocket and his house free and clear. Okay, so between his home and the cash you got in your pocket, you are, that value is a value of two forty nine seven fifty. Well, his home is worth about two forty. I actually okay. uh, uh, left the closing with just under ten thousand in my in my pocket, even nine thousand seven fifty. I would assume, yeah, right, exactly. Okay. exactly. Yeah, and so now I'm into his house for two hundred and forty thousand, and I'm doing work on it um, as we speak. Um, and I should be able to, like I say, it's it's a neighborhood of, of two seventy five to two ninety five. This one leans closer to the two ninety five. Um, so I should be able to, um, you know, come out with a, a nice little profit on his place, even though I didn't really want it. Um, okay. It it you know it got me out from under a house that wasn't you know wasn't i mean it was selling i sold it three times i sold it four <laughs> times four right. times for two hundred and forty nine thousand dollars. one time i actually got to 
closing the limit. So, you know, so, so it wasn't that it wasn't saleable, but it was, you know, it was just circumstances. I find, I find it interesting. So the funniest thing about this is, if, for those keeping score at home, um, this is a project that uh, you fa you've said that this was your favorite project and you faced delays, uh, a bunch of gotchas that led you to going way over your budget. Uh, you had to deal with possible contamination of the land. Three total buyers walked away. The fourth buyer had to actually barter uh, his home to get you uh, to the closing table. Um, so what I want to do now is I want to go to another commercial break. And then when we come back, I want you to explain to me with all of that why this is your favorite house as opposed to the house that kicked you out of the business. So we'll be right back. Rent Tech Direct provides you with an easy-to-use yet robust platform for managing your properties, complete with its built-in reporting and accounting system that can be customized to fit your business. For property managers, you get advanced features like simplified owner distributions, automated management and placement fees, an owner portal, plus the software is certified for trust accounting. All this comes backed by the highest rated customer support team in the industry, certified by third parties and ranked number one by our clients year over year. You get unlimited free access to our US-based support team by phone, email, and chat who will help you getting started or anywhere along the way. All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, we're sitting with Terry. And Terry, I, I got to say, I, I, I got to know the story behind why this is your favorite. Because for me, we're looking at delays, over budget, contamination. Three buyers walked away and the fourth buyer didn't pay us cash. Uh, you had to take his home and now you've worked yourself into another project. So... Uh, one thing I want to say, though, Terry, when you finish that project, do you want to come on the show and tell us about that project? We'll update on your story. Well, I, maybe that one. I've got one that's more interesting. Going more interesting. It's not more interesting than this one, though, is it? Well, I moved a house. Jesus, Terry, we're going to have to have you on a few times. You might have to be a regular for us. But you remember, you remember that vacant lot that I mentioned? There's yes, ma'am now a house poised about seven feet in the air over it and they were pouring concrete when i was there this morning so wow okay <laughs> guys so everyone watching one, yeah. if, the, if this is the first time you've watched the house flipping show here on holt wise tv do yourself a favor and smash that subscribe button because uh terry's just flipping the craziest houses in the world maybe the one that's uh, in the air will eventually become her her new favorite but as of right now this underground house flip in Grand Junction is your favorite flip. And again, delays over budget, contamination, three buyers walked away. The fourth buyer had to trade you his house. Why is this your favorite house, Terry? Tell me. It's, it's my favorite because my, my vision worked. What I saw, okay. I produced, and my end product was so good. I mean, my con my last few contractors that were doing you know once we were past rough end stage and we're going in they were like wow this is really nice it was just a really nice product and and yes it it took a it took some special buyers because of the size it wasn't going to be a big family home for somebody but but my vision worked and the product was great and people you know kind of got what i was doing um and Yes, I had those cost overruns and things um, that weren't foreseen, but but in reality, I did what I set out to do, and I, I finished it, and I learned a ton. I'm a lifelong learner. I'm always reading stuff. I'm always listening to podcasts, and you know, I'm a news total news junkie and stuff. And and I just I learned so much, um, and I met um, and acquired some great people that I hadn't worked with before. In addition to using some people that I had and. And yeah, I just loved it. And I'm just really proud of what I did and, and how it all turned out because it worked, you know, um, so other, than, uh, other than, other than the fat prep. So I spent all of 2018 on a project uh, and made $2,000, which didn't make my, you know, my income taxes look great for a year, but, sure. otherwise. <laughs> but, but more of a passion project. So for you, it's, it's, it's about the passion. It's about the project. 
You know, uh, I, I love small spaces. I love the idea that I was creating a multifamily and where somebody, I didn't know exactly who my end buyer would be, but I knew it would either be an investor or somebody that was going to use that, that second space to help offset a mortgage. And um, I just wanted to kind of prove that you don't have to build these grand palaces to have comfortable, neat living space. And yeah, yeah. Very cool. And I assume there was probably a, l a little bit of, uh, since you and your husband have been in the area for so long, maybe a little bit of uh, improving the neighborhood, a little bit of that. Yeah. Rejuvenation Homes, my, my motto on the, the uh, website is making neighborhoods better one house at a time. And in fact, I, I made a joke recently, um, and that's on my sign. I put a sign out in front um, of project houses. It says, you know, we buy houses, we buy ugly houses, we sell pretty houses, you know, that sort of thing. And it says sure. right on there. Um, and so when I moved that other house recently, um, I sent it as a joke out to, you know, some of my people that said, okay, we, we make neighborhoods better one house at a time, even if we have to steal the house from somewhere else. Um, <laughs> 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 well, very good. Uh, Terry, thank you for coming on the show. And uh, I saw on your website, Rejuvenation Homes, um, you also are running a blog on there. You want to quickly just tell our viewers what that's all about and if they'd like to hear more about your story, uh, where they could find you and uh, what types of things you're writing about? Sure. I, I write about essentially real estate issues. I kind of uh, documented my real estate journey from the first house I bought for six thousand dollars in West Virginia, and and you know, kind of brought it forward, and things that I've learned, and other things to do with housing. And so, you're welcome to check it out. It's rejuvenationhomesinc.com, and um, yeah. So I try to add content every month as far as the actual blog, but I keep pictures going all the time of, of projects I'm working on and, and things. So. All right, guys, special thanks to Terry for coming on the show and telling us all her story. Again, if you guys are interested in hearing more about Terry and her story, perhaps reading her blog, I have put a, a link to her company, Rejuvenation Homes, Inc. I've put a link to all of that in the show notes below. Take a look at that. I hope to have Terry on a few more episodes of the house flipping shows because she is flipping the most unique homes and the most unique projects out there. Um, and, you know, this was a cool story because, you know, again, she didn't really make any money on this deal, uh, but she learned a lot. And I think the audience learned a lot. I think you guys learned a lot. And that's what's cool about these house flip projects. Um, and that's why, you know, we're going nationwide, worldwide, actually. You know, you don't have to be in the United States to come on the house flipping show here. Uh, anybody who's flipped a house, I think there is something of value there. I think there's something to learn there. So, you know, if you're like a full-time home flipper and you've done a deal where you made like a six-figure project, profit you know we want to talk to you but we also want to talk to you if you're a brand new house flipper and you want to tell us the story about your very first flip win lose or draw we think that there's something to learn when an investor flips a home every home has a story every project has a story and i think there's educational value in that so if you've flipped a house before and you'd like to come on this show and tell us your story, go ahead and drop a comment about your project in the comments below. And a member from my media team is going to reach out to you and we can possibly schedule you to come on and tell the world your story. If you found a ton of value in today's show, do us a favor and engage with the video. Whether you want to give it a like or share it or just drop us a comment in the comment section below. Anytime you find value you in what we're doing here on Holton Wise TV. If you can engage with the video, it lets YouTube's algorithm know that you are seeing that value and it helps us expose this brand to others. And you know, that obviously allows us to bring in more revenue. The more revenue we bring in, the more we can put back into the show. And if this is the first time you've ever seen a show here on Holton Wise TV, do yourself a favor and smash that subscribe button. As always, I'm James Wise with Holton Wise, and this is Real Estate Investing Made Easy. Back, 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 back to those days. I was running, 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 running in one place. Set a, set a, set a, set a, set a, set a, set a pace. Feel like I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been running in one place. Yeah, I've been feeling pretty good. I've been feeling great. I've been feeling how I should, how I really should. High Return Real Estate is a true turnkey machine in Indianapolis, Indiana. This company was built for investors by investors. 
We buy, rehab, inspect, tenant, and sell stabilized turnkey real estate to investors with complete transparency on every step of the process. Every property we sell comes with a third-party inspection, both before and after the rehab, along with a six-month warranty on all major system renovations and our exclusive in-house property management team that has one goal in mind, provide our clients with high return real estate. For more information, subscribe to our mailing list in the show notes below or visit us online at highreturnrealestate.com. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on our latest content including video tours and analysis of investment properties that are available for sale, real estate investment education, and our most interesting encounters with tenants from health. Holton Wise, real estate investing made easy.